we'll move on to the next section of this, which was to have uh, Tim and, I'm going to say it wrong, Aidan, uh, come up and talk about their uh, data centre migration from CSU. So if you could please make them welcome. That really is a big green button, isn't it? Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'll be chatting about what CSU's just done um, with their data centre. It's a little bit of a counterpoint to the whole cloud discussion. Um, uh, forgive my uh, reading the big printed out notes. My eyesight's um, complete rubbish. So um, if I'm doing a bit of this, I'm not trying to be rude. Now, if I'm looking like this, I'm not trying to be condescending. It's just old man things kicking in there. Um, so a little bit of history, if you'll bear with me. So CSU um, came about after the amalgamation um, of Mitchell College of Advanced Education and the Riverina Murray Institute of Higher Education, and this is back in um, 1989. So um, the joining of those two institutions basically left us with uh, data centre infrastructure at uh, the two larger campus sites uh, at Bathurst and Wagga. Um, and uh, at that stage, each site obviously had systems that were required. We've taken two institutions, they were managed together to form a university, and they each had their own student systems and um, their own finance systems. Um, and the actual you know, ability for those to merge together took time. That was something that wasn't going to, um, to happen overnight. Um, each site had its own DR of sorts because they were separate institutions and each site had been thinking about DR. Um, so um, they each had these, uh, these, these DR sites. Um, and you know, effectively they were just another building on campus and that's where the tapes were stored and there were a couple of servers there with the vague hope that if, any, if everything went to crap um, we might be able to get a service to operate in those areas. Um, and those remained. Um, so each site, after two institutions have joined together, was reluctant to give up their toys. Uh, the IT on each site, you know, um, wanted to be the ones that kept their toys. Um, so what we had at this point was effectively two early 80s data centres um, at, the, at those sites with which to pro uh, provide IT services. Um, and the services were split amongst those sites, often based on the closeness of the users using that service. So a particular site would be picked over the other site based on the cohort or the number of um, you know, students or staff that were accessing a service that were arbitrarily picked to, to go in each, either one of those data centres. Um, so eventually the rivalries faded into history um, and we got on with providing the IT services. Over time there were incremental upgrades that occurred. You know, we upgraded UPSs, generators were added, you know, um, servers were upgraded, networks were upgraded. All that happened, but fundamentally those two data centres were still those early 1980s data centres um, that had just had a lot of stuff tacked onto them as they um, went along. So um, this brings us to about mid-2015. Um, the smaller data centres on each site remained uh, but we really had moved to having uh, a primary data centre at the Wagga site and a secondary data centre at the Wagga site. The Wagga site hold, held all of our uh, QA servers and dev servers, but there was still some prod stuff there as well, just because that's where it was. Um, and we had a big fat pipe from our net that went between them and we did all our um, data centre replication over them. Um, and by this stage, we had you know, at least one of our uh, connections to the internet um, was up at, um, at 10 gig. Um, so I suppose this is where our, you know, our problems um, began. So um, the Wagga site, particularly, we had regular power issues uh, due to storms and supplier events. Um, the old building power distribution um, did give us a lot of troubles. It really had been tacked on over many years um, and did cause us uh, a lot of power problems. There were AC issues. Um, 
uh, that on, on, in some instances took three, four, up to a week uh, of, of time to resolve. So we're you know, running on backup AC and warm data centres, uh, which was a big problem for us. We didn't have any dedicated facilities management staff dealing with these data centres. They were, um, you know, the same guys that were dealing with, uh, you know, putting a light bulb in, in the toilets were the same guys that would be called out to fix the data centre. Um, there was little experience in managing uh, DC level facilities and infrastructure. It, it just wasn't uh, facilities core business. Um, and in the Wagga site, we actually had uh, the data centre located on the third floor and there was no lift. Um, all gear coming in and out of that site went upstairs. Um, which wasn't my problem, but it was certainly a problem to a lot of people. Um, yeah, lots of fun getting racks and sands and all sorts of stuff up on, on um, trolleys. D people delivering things were literally heartbroken upon um, arrival. Um, so, uh, oop, oop, now I'm in trouble. Um, Bathurst was in, a, was in a better state. It had gone through a sort of a bit more of a refresh um, recently, um, but it, we, still had, we still had power issues um, there. It was, it was still substandard by, you know, by any real measure. Uh, the backup DC was in a basement. Um, and it had been prone to flooding. Um, uh, apparently it was found, um, you know, not that long ago that when they built another building, someone had poured a large amount of concrete into a drain. Um, and it really did flood, like water gushing across the floor uh, of that site. Um, and surprisingly enough, all these things were starting to affect our ability to deliver reliable IT services. Um, so, Add to all of this uh, what we were in the middle of from the comms, uh, the network side was we were in the middle of a, um, we, we were doing a refresh as well. That's not even the slide I'm talking to. Um, yeah, so the gear, yes, t it was genuinely 12 years old by the time we started to do something about it. 6,500s there ticking away, doing their job, job. God bless them. They worked more out of habit um, than anything else. Um, uh, and We'd, we'd upgraded stuff along the way. We had some Nexus gear in there and we tacked stuff on and we were doing what we could, but uh, generally the core router's sitting there, um, you know, very little other than some firmware upgrades had changed in the, in the time that they'd been um, deployed. So um, it was becoming pretty apparent that Wagga especially, we had to do something there, that DC needed to be replaced. Um, the real question was, uh, what were we going to do? So, um, like anybody, after shifting the blame to somebody else, we commissioned some third-party assessments to go on, because if it all went wrong, we could blame them. Um, and we went out to a number of third parties for recommendations. Um, and as part of the assessment, we considered a lot of things, really. So uh, there was a lot of plans for the construction of a new facility at Wagga. Um, though there was a lot of work done to actually assess building sites and, and costs. That was all costed up um, as a legitimate option for us. Um, of course, we evaluated um, you know, shipping container drop-in things. We looked for sites to be able to put a shipping container in. We had people in doing modular DCs, you know, build a shed and put your own modular DC um, stuff in. Um, we also investigated the viability of actually uh, doing a colo um, as well. Um, so this took a long time, lots of consultants coming back with their own um, conflicting solutions. You get you know, three or four consultants in, each one tells us that they've got the solution and it happens to be each one of the different options we had. Um, but uh, in the end, when we were considering everything, uh, this was our penny drop moment and probably the core part of our um, decision was that realisation that CSU was just not in the business of providing a modern DC facility um, and the sobering realisation that the truth was we just weren't very good at it um, and we weren't doing a very good job of that. Um, 
and um, and I'm not really talking about the teams that looked after the networks or servers there. Uh, this was really about uh, environment, power and air conditioning um, and the general environments to those, um, those data centres. Um, so, all very well and good my history lesson, but what is my point, and it's this, um, things change over time. Lots of little changes that all made sense at the time, all done for a good reason, um, take us from one place um, to another. Um, and what CSU needed to do was just stop for a while and have a good look at where we were, acknowledge that we were not happy with the current DC environment, and also recognise that the best interests of the university were not going to be met um, with another additive change, uh, and that we genuinely needed um, a fresh start. So there was a new data strategy, new data centre strategy was adopted. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the university needed to pursue a long-term solution to data centre facilities and flexi was flexible enough to leverage the emerging the emergence of advanced cloud services based on words with capital letters at the beginning and the end and uh, were filled with A's. Um, it, it went something like that. Um, so what happened was we, um, we decided that um, Colo was for us. Uh, and that we, we would keep the Wagga data, sorry, we would move the Wagga data centre to a colo, we would keep the newer one at Bathurst, um, and the underlying basic reason for that, in, in a way, was that we would move the really broken one out, that we weren't able to, you know, we, we'd admitted to ourselves we couldn't look after a data centre, this one was particularly broken, we'd move it out, and we would keep the one at Bathurst, um, because that was known and safe and it gave us a warm, fuzzy feeling that we were still in control of our lives. Um, but the truth was that the more we worked through the plan, uh, the more we realised that moving both of those data centres uh, out to a colo was, uh, at, at this point, uh, the better solution. So that is uh, what we decided to do. So we... Uh, went with Macquarie Telecom. Um, you know, there were lots of, lots of reasons that um, we went with those guys. There's a lot of stuff there, but effectively, though, they had a data centre that wasn't rubbish. Um, and, you know, I won't read through all the things, but, you know, it, it, met, it, ticked, all the, it ticked all the boxes, met all the criteria. Um, you know, standard stuff you would expect in the data centre that we weren't able to provide. Um, it had the RNet connectivity that we were looking for already. Um, so uh, there was some corded pricing involved, which was attractive. Uh, we opted for a 36-month contract. They were charging based on power, pretty standard stuff. Um, CSU... You know, not being that huge, we had uh, went for ten racks um, at each of the the, the two sites uh, as our uh, as our initial um, deployment size. Um, and Macquarie Telecom would do all the all the lift and shift um, for us as part of the agreement. So, um, you know, they would come and move uh, the lot to those sites. So team commitment was a big thing, um, and it wasn't as bad as we'd originally thought. So um, big change for CSU, taking all our um, data centres and, and, you know, and, and moving them effectively and what effect that would have on staff and how they were going to feel about that, um, people worrying about their jobs uh, and what that would mean. Um, so it was really important that we actually got uh, both the, the networks team and the, and the systems team especially um, on board. Um, but that wasn't, um, really wasn't as hard as, as we thought. And, and once we'd explained to the, to the teams what we were doing while we were doing it, um, you know, e everybody actually did, um, did come on board quite well. Um, so once, once we had completed that, we basically started our transformation projects because there was a lot to do. Um, um, so with the teams committed, um, the transformation projects begin uh, working with the business stakeholders, 
there was a decommissioning of, you know, trying to clean everything up, decommissioned all the old servers we possibly could, consolidating services where we could, migrating anything that could possibly go to a VM uh, within the time frames that we could. Um, we had a lot of migration off old legacy um, load balancers that were actually uh, stuck in those uh, 6500s, so we had to, you know, do a migration off those onto new load balancers because we weren't moving the 6500s. Uh, there were UCS hardware upgrades. Uh, and there was a lot of work went into getting uh, all that sorted out. Um, so it, it was also a big change for us in terms of the WAN. So um, CSU has, has a lot of long distance WAN connections because we're spread out over um, a lot of sort of regional New South Wales. Um, we've got a lot of WAN connections in place. Um, to make all that work, and we'd structured everything over the years so that Bathurst and Wagga was, a, you know, was the centre of the universe. So we designed, that's where the data centres were, that's where the data had to get back to, uh, and we were, we were about to change um, what that meant. Um, so we had to, to replan that. Um, we, um, so we set about with, with Arnet on planning what the new WAN would look like, um, the upgrades, the reshuffling of the services to better fit the new DC locations. Um, as I said earlier, the fact that Arnett already had the connections in there was just a nice tick box. That meant we didn't have to do too much extra planning for that. There was a bit of diversity work. Uh, my colleague Aidan will have a, a, a bit more of a solid run, run through of the actual steps that we went through um, to do this uh, in a minute. Um, so, but we did, we did need a staged um, plan to complete the moves. We needed to, you know, keep all our connectivity in place. Um, but we also wanted to assure the best redundancy we could now that we were moving everything off um, those two main teaching site campuses, that if we did have any WAN failures, then, you know, we'd lose access, you know, we'd lose access to everything. So redundancy for that WAN, you know, became even more critical than it had been in the past. Um, and then we just worked through that plan with Arnet over time and with the business um, of, you know, of scheduling all the, all the cutovers to the migration to all those services over time. Um, so the new DC prep, um, like anything, reasonably obvious, I suppose, but um, it was all about um, planning. Um, so we used an open source product called um, OpenDCM to do all the rack diagrams and the copper and fiber patching plan because um, it's free. Um, and it actually did a really good job. We were pretty poor in our old data centres because we had the luxury of just you know, going in and uh, having a staff member there to, uh, to do patching and fixing things. Some of our documentation wasn't as good as it could be. Um, that was a luxury. We weren't going to have the new data centres. Um, the majority of, um, of my network staff are either at Bathurst or Wagga. Um, it's a fair hike to get to Sydney to have to do something. Um, so the documentation was um, paramount in terms of being able to have a contractor turn up and make sure that we had everything um, right when you were every cable, when everything was labelled. Um, uh, so all the rack cabling was installed by Macquarie Telecom according to the plan. Um, all the new network kit was installed in each of the new DCs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a, and one of the DCs is in Pitt Street, the other one's at North Ride. Um, and we worked through with Rnet to get our into DC um, WAN online. So in the end, what we had was all the network gear sitting there idle at both sites. Uh, the DC routers um, cranked up, all the switching running, um, all the WAN links up to the other campuses uh, sitting there. So in terms of the upgrade from a network's perspective, we got it easy. We effectively got to do a greenfield site and have it all sitting there humming away, waiting for the um, service to turn up, which was a godsend because having to have worked through um, all of that in, the, in an existing um, DC environment would have been a lot harder. So um, we got out of it pretty light. Um, at the same time, we were doing a network upgrade. So we were between the two data centre moves um, we actually started to replace the entire um, switching and, um, and wireless fleet um, at the same time. Um, it, it, was, it was poor time, but we just had to work through it from a, from a staff resourcing perspective. Uh, we'll just move and upgrade all the things. So 
Um, as part of the agreement, as I said, from Macquarie Telecom, uh, they audited all the existing gear. You know, everything was labelled. Uh, we negotiated the uh, with the business uh, for the DC outages. For uh, we basically had an outage for an entire weekend agreed to from the business. Uh, all the production services were moved from. Uh, to the Bathurst DC, even though Bathurst was supposed to have all the production services, there was still stuff at Wagga. So um, basically everything that could be migrated to the, to the Bathurst data centre was uh, migrated. Uh, Macquarie Telecom turned up with lots of bubble wrap and a big truck um, and basically loaded the Wagga data centre up and drove off into the sunset. Uh, we crossed our fingers and hoped there wasn't a large explosion uh, in that truck's future. Uh, they got to the IC1DC, unpacked the lot, plugged it back in as per the patching plan. Uh, we obviously had our network and server teams uh, on site to, to assist with bringing those systems back online. And it all worked. Everyone gets up on these presentations and said, yes, we're great, and it was all good. Um, but it did. It actually it, it worked. There, there, were no, there were no problems. We had um, you know, the standard stuff. There were a couple of patching issues, and I think there was one server that needed its RAM reseeding after the trip. Um, but everything, everything came up, everything was you know, predominantly patched where it was supposed to be um, and did actually just work. Um, and then what we did was we just did the reverse uh, again for the, uh, for the production DC. We moved everything in production that was absolutely critical um, over to the, uh, to the DR site that was now in IC1. Um, and uh, once again, Macquarie Telecom came, we packed everything up moved it, plugged it back in, um, and, and it worked. Um, so look, there's a high view of the schedule. So it, look, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight from sort of planning to you know, um, you know, final auditing and stuff. It took us uh, the course of the, the year to work through um, the, the project, the various stages of um, doing the transformations, freezing changes in those data centres um, in terms of equipment and, and any other changes before the moves. Um, so, you know, I want to make it sound like it was you know, quick and easy, but we managed to, to get through that. Um, I won't go through a great deal of that. Um, it obviously ticked all CSU's green uh, requirements. Um, I took the dollars out from here because I couldn't get approval from anyone to tell you what the dollars were necessarily. Um, but there were genuine savings um, you know, on facilities and, and power and long-term capital expenditures. It, 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 um, it, it ticked all the boxes there as well. We actually are um, you know, well ahead on saving the money. We've got a better service and it's costing us less. Um, operational benefits in terms of that the stuff's not, um, you know, the data centres actually work now and the power doesn't go away and there's no heating um, dramas. We're in Sydney now, so we can actually get a support contract that's um, you know, a couple of hours as opposed to next business day, which was the best we could do in, in Bathurst or Wagga. It's easier for us to dispose of our gear. It's easier for us to get um, contractors from vendors to turn up on site and do work for us. Um, the DFM staff who weren't really trained to do the work don't have to worry about it. They can get on with their, their, with their real jobs. Um, uh, genuine environmental impact benefits, um, which I won't go into again. Um, I didn't have the data for the, uh, the power consumption stuff, but we're genuinely consuming far less electricity than we were. Um, so once again, all that's uh, good results for us. Um, the IntelliCentre 1 is their older data centre. It's a little bit uh, more traditional uh, style, but that's our DR site. Um, uh, IC2 is a uh, much nicer hot aisle, cold aisle situation for our prod gear. Uh, and I'll just pass over to Aidan just to do um, a bit of a quick run through of some of the technical... Um, Really big one there. It's uh, it's going to have to be very, very quick. I've uh, I've been told to wrap it up, but um, <laughs> I'll I'll try to lightning round this one. I don't have too much there. There's actually some things I've left out, and uh, and I'll probably now leave more stuff out. But uh, here we go. So the first thing we had to do was fix up the WAN. So we we had a situation where we'd had Bathurst and Wagga as the centre of the universe, 
that was no longer applicable. We had to make sure that we had WAN redundancy to these data centres in, in a way that we needed. That included dual redundancy, that was the original plan. Uh, that's now Triversity. This is the initial WAN that we had. You can see that Wagga and Bathurst are the, are the main two sites. There was a redundant 10 gig loop through UTS which provided our A4 connection. That also carried all our layer two traffic uh, in case those two main links, in case that main link between Wagga and Bathurst had failed. That, that situation worked really well and then we went, oh, well now we're gonna be in Sydney. What can we do here to fix this? So the very first change was we brought the two data centers online. We brought the dual connections from Arnet, east and west in Sydney. The original plan had been a single link between the two DCs, but after we had a look at the WAN and drew it up on a board, we found that there would be a single point of failure because of the way the fibres went across the bridge. With, uh, with Port Macquarie coming down to IC2, I think it was, and, um, and with the Goulburn site hitting IC1, it didn't, didn't quite work, so we had to go with dual redundancy, which now we're at Triversity, which is excellent. We then moved Port Macquarie, Goulburn and Homebush to those sites as well. I'm going to skip a bit here. Um, Albury then went 10 gig as well. We had an equipment issue there, so we'd had to hold off there. Once that happened, we decommissioned the link from Wagga to Canberra. And then the final step, we moved Orange in as well, same situation. We installed our 10 gig equipment there. We then had a 10 gig WAN that went all the way around, full redundancy both directions. And with that dual link from Arnet, we no longer needed to carry any layer two across the WAN through any of the main campuses, which was awesome because I went from having about, what was it, 30 VLANs on each switch down to about eight which was great. Uh, the, main, the main thoughts, as I said there, you always got to compare your logical and physical paths. You may not be getting what you expect without drawing it up. Um, the speed upgrades we achieved on the WAN, we went from one gig everywhere to 10 gig to all the major sites without any real cost increases. I think there was a slight increase, but by rationalising our circuits, we were able to do it quite cheaply. And uh, there's no replacement for a face-to-face -face meeting and a WAN drawing on a whiteboard. So setting up the DC, we had dual 6880 XLs. We went with the XLs because we needed to take the full BGP table. That's for our data classification on our pro series. The, the WAN connections are split across the chassis and they're run in VSS. There, there are two at each site. We also have another one at Canberra just on its own that does our secondary pop um, and it's an XL as well. We've used a similar model through the rest of the core but we didn't use the XLs and we've used 6840s where we didn't need large boxes or 6807s where we needed high density. Uh, the ACI fabric connects to each of those boxes as well, and it's redundant as well. We've then got 3850s for outer band management. Those sit off to the side. They're dual connected back to the 6880s. Everything that we need to reach if the data center goes down is attached to those. There's, um, there's an inbuilt VPN on an 887 that Macquarie Telecom supplied us that we use for our outer band disaster recovery management. Those hosts are set up with a totally separate password, totally separate everything, so if we lose our data centers, we can still get to things. And there's an Avacent UMG serial box in there as well that lets us get to the consoles. We're using ACI, as Tim said. I haven't included the models here, but we're using the 9336 spine, which is the baby spine, and the 9372Ts and Ps, which is the copper and fibre. We went end of, end of row for the fibre and, and top of rack for the copper, just due to simplicity. So the, the first decision we had with ACI was do we go Nexus mode or ACI mode? Nexus mode we were familiar with, we had the 5Ks already, we knew exactly how to set it up, how it worked, but you didn't get any of the cool SDN gains and, um, and the fabric would then require manual setup for everything and if we wanted to change something we'd have to be in there messing with it again. That had been a problem with the 5Ks and we weren't keen to repeat it. Uh, and ACI mode gave us all those cool SDN features which we're using not many yet, but uh, soon maybe. Uh, it was new technology though, we were, we were afraid. It wouldn't work the way we thought. Um, though those issues we did actually have when we first set it up, but Cisco came in and gave us a hand, which was quite good. Um, the biggest issue with the fabric, I don't, I don't know if anybody here is using ACI, but the biggest thing that we found so far is that because the fabric is magic and you don't know how any of it works, it's quite hard to troubleshoot. You, um, you have an issue and you go, well, I don't know which switch it's crossing, I don't know how it's getting there and I can't see how it works. We haven't had many issues that have needed troubleshooting, and the one that we did have was, um, which I'll address in a sec, was a, was a layer two optimization issue, which we managed to find pretty quickly. The um, federation was another question, the decision of whether to join the two DCs into one giant fabric or, uh, or to use two. 
We ended up having that decision made for us. There was an ACI limitation. You couldn't federate with 10 gig optics. You had to use 40s. Cisco assured us that was coming soon. But, um, but at the time, we didn't have a choice, and it, it saved us having that argument anyway. Now, ACI, it, it is designed to do the routing as well. If you want micro-segmentation, you have to separate it onto the ACI fabric. We weren't ready to take that risk at that point. It was already a big enough change for the business. We set it up in layer two. We have a single application with a series of EPGs under it. That, um, that system basically works layer two transport. You get trunks in, trunks out to our VMs, uh, access ports out to the copper equipment, things like that. It, it's fairly simple. We will be turning routing on when we get a QA environment, but at the moment we're too afraid to mess with it. Uh, so here you go, final design was dual WAN between our net. We had the single WAN out north and south to the other campuses. We've got port channel between the DC for simplicity. We did consider doing a single link, two single links. The port channel was much easier. We've got the diverse paths, so we've got our resiliency. We've got a WAN from each DC that goes to other sites as well. Now there's a one gig and a 10 gig out of each data center to another site. So there's, I guess, quadversity in the end. Um, the DCs are connected into our 10 gig WAN ring and they host our uh, ACI fabric. They also host our primary pop a whole string of other service, our UCX SBCs are in there as well. And we've just recently added our Telstra SIP connections as well. So those routers are doing even more. Uh, very short on time here, sorry, let me rush through. Um, final thoughts on the DC and the ACI design. The fabric uses VX lands. Some things can't traverse that fabric. Trustec SGTs is one, one prime example. We did need to send those through the WAN. So there was a couple of VLANs we had to include. Um, the optimised layer two settings on the fabric was another thing. Cisco assured us this would be fine, do it, it'll be great. Um, I, I hoped it was, it wasn't. The, um, the non-federated fabrics didn't expect to see optimised L2 traffic, so the, you would cross from one fabric to another and the other fabric didn't know what it was and would just drop half the data, which was a whole thing. Um, other than that, as Tim said, ACI worked the way we had. We'd set it up in the, in, before anything had come in using DCIM. And once we went live, I pretty much sat there in the room and helped the systems guys with a couple of patching jobs. Everything else just worked from our point of view, which was amazing. Any questions? <laughs>